Well, thank you, ladies. I was, uh, I always used to like to use this special music time to reflect on the first message and it kind of maybe drew me back, not only to Mr. Shemit's three R's, but it drew me back into the feast. And if you notice the, the, the way in which the piece is created and crafted, I mean, it's like us all going to various feast sites, whether it be Hong Kong or whether it be New York or whether it be, you know, uh, that site that's below the border down here. Um, <laughs> But I'm saying it's like, you know, we all come back with the same hope of the message, but all the messages don't have to be identical. You know, we aren't given a, uh, I guess you would say, a lexicon and told everybody's told to preach this message and this message. No, we rely on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to bring out that hope around the world. So uh, thank you very much, ladies. I was just, Mr. Garnett said that my slides had, really, had better be very good. So you can count him for the right thing to say. But um, uh, hello to Valerie. She's uh, fighting a, a cold that uh, kind of came home from the feast with us. Uh, I have managed to stay away from it. Uh, I think my my sister also has it, and uh, uh, see Steve here today. So anyway, um, Laurel had it right at the end of the feast, but she flew home with hers and infected everybody else along the way. And <laughs> no, I'm <geez. laughs> No, we drugged her up so she could come home. So anyway, that um, was good. But we were in Lake, uh, Lake George, New York uh, with my parents, uh, my siblings. Uh, so we had a lovely time. Uh, there were no fall colors. Uh, and that was just, it was just gorgeous though. You know, they had some rain. I told Jay Ledbetter, who was the coordinator, he's kind of like, oh, you know, it's raining today. I said, it's liquid sunshine. We're from Southern California. Let it rain. <laughs> it was green. And so we were thrilled. So... Okay, so, you know, um, as we come off the feast and the eighth day festival, I think we're full of, as I mentioned, this hope, the hope that God has a plan for all. And I think it, um, the message of the last, the eighth day is probably, to me, the most exciting message. Uh, it, stands alone. It makes us as a body of people stand alone, that no one has been forgotten, um, that the, the people before the flood, you know, the people uh, prior to the, uh, the AD and BC split, you know, I mean, everybody, God has got this, uh, if he is a God of love, has to include a plan for all. And so that is very encouraging to me. Um, but as I come back from this, I realize that, as Mr. Shemit said, we have some everyday world challenges. And I think if we take the glow of the feast with us, it allows us to perhaps address a, a little challenge that um, I think is in the world around us and that uh, spills off into us. And so the title of my message is Fitting in with God, God's Calling for Your Life. And I hope that we can spread this news uh, of the feast uh, of the wonder that God has for all mankind, uh, the inclusiveness of it. And what I want to do today is I want to talk a little about some generational dynamics uh, from the Barna Group because it spreads into our everyday life. Uh, it spreads in from our Gen Z young people, age 13 to 18, which I think pivots to all of us because so much is geared towards uh, marketing to this group. Um, and uh, some of you uh, know this uh, perhaps even more than I do, but, uh, and I think it, it helps, uh, then we need to say, well, what is the greatest fear of this group? Because I think that great fear that we find now coming out from research uh, that this group has uh, is something that we have the perfect answer for, and that is you need to turn to God. You need a cleansed life, you need Jesus Christ in your life, you need the Holy Spirit, and this is the way you fit in with God, this is the way you excel, this is what will happen in the world tomorrow, we will lead people. And Jesus said on the great me message of the seventh day of the feast, Jesus said what? I, what? If any man thirst, let him come unto me. This is the mantra of the world tomorrow. This is the manifesto. Uh, we won't need a new democracy. We will need God's way, people living God's way. And so that's kind of where I'm going to take us to look at a few antidotes for some of these great fears uh, that I think have gripped um, a generation and thus spill into all of us. So let's take a look. There is the Gen Z, they call them. These are the uh, young people aged 13 to 18. 
Um, actually, it's down to zero, to 18, but they legally cannot uh, survey people under the age of 13. Uh, both, uh, it would be, you'd be leading them, and so you can't really get any meaningful research. But uh, what's interesting is this, they're coming of age in a totally digitally saturated environment, okay? Everybody in this room has a cell phone, right? Okay, everybody has, a, uh, has an implement, a tablet, several, multiple, m most of us, you know, have at least one TV. We all have probably more than one TV or screen in our homes, etc. We are a digitally saturated area. We now have them in our cars, right? There's a display screen. You know what I mean? Well, I don't know how, whether how primitive it is, whether maybe it's some of you are still driving, you know, a 1975 Cadillac, right, that hasn't, you know, just the, the, the norm high, low max on it, right? But anyway, um, but everybody is a screenager today. Not just this group, but it's, it identifies this group specifically. Um, my uh, statistics are taken from the Barna Group's Gen Z book entitled The Culture, Beliefs, and Motivations Shaping the Next Generation. Uh, was in partnership with uh, 360 Institute. And what's fascinating is this graph that I created. 57% um, of this age group spend four or more hours a day on media. It really isn't shocking to us, right? Um, what's fascinating is four to eight hours make up 31%. Eight plus hours is 26%. So that's why I added those two to get 57% of them spend four or more hours of media a day. Well, we spend time on media too, don't we? The news, movies, sports. Uh, now, I, and when we talk about media, we're not talking about the time they spend on their devices on schoolwork, okay? Just to be clear, they tease that out. We're not talking about the fact that you have to study your textbook on an iPad or on a screen or device, okay? This is the world we live in. They are, uh, Jean Twenge makes her comment in her book that they have radically changed every aspect of these young people's lives. Radically changed. Generational dynamics are important for us, I submit to you, because they underscore what each age group has as a challenge and where there are similarities. And thus, we can understand how to fill those souls if they are getting filled with only digital media. Now, I'd like to branch into an interesting point. While this generation is technically, physically safer than ever before in any generation, living in the United States, we're only talking about the United States, I'm not talking about the rest of the world, etc. But in living in the United States, our young people are physically safer than ever. However, the data shows that they are psychologically more vulnerable than any prior generation. 33% of this generation, 33% of our children under the age of 18 have been bullied online. Bullied online. Ask them. I mean, we, we, we don't mean, you know, a knockout, dragout fight, but they've been teased, made fun of in a, in a way which is over the line. Okay? Now, we all went to middle school. I realize middle school can be brutal. Okay? Right? And people can say things that they shouldn't say, et cetera, et cetera. But saying it to your face, okay, and having to look at you the next hour, the next class, et cetera, is totally different than being bullied online where you're hiding behind a screen and you're worried about what other people will say and think and because of your likes. 45% of this age group visit social media every, every single day. Now, that also is similar to every, every grandmother in the room visits their <laughs> family's Facebook probably more than once a day. I mean, it's fascinating, okay? You, we do realize uh, Jason Dorsey in his uh, Generational Dynamics work uh, cites the fact that the age group that adopts uh, mobile device technology the fastest is over 55. They have the money, they have the time, and you, you, you look in line, right? You, you look around. Some of the grandmas, 
iPhone 9, 10, Samsung. I mean, hey, they got the money. I want that one. Just so they can look at Facebook from their kids. Is it grandkids? It's fascinating. Okay. FOMO. This age group has a great concern. Fear of missing out. This is a huge challenge. Huge challenge. In 2011, for the first time in 24 years, teen suicide is higher than teen homicide. So we have greater connectivity with all kinds of people than ever before. Yet teen suicide is higher. Why? The tanks are not getting full through the interaction from social media. Now look, I am not down on social media. Per se, okay? I have more devices, I have websites, I have Facebook. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we must recognize the challenges, the positiveness, and the similarities that we all share with our young people so that we can help fill any empty tanks. We sang a lovely hymn, page one, wasn't page one, page 65. It talks about God will fill the longing soul. Our souls we're wanting and waning at some point. And we went to God. He forgave our sins. He gave us his Holy Spirit all through Jesus Christ. This fills the soul. It really connects everybody in the right way, right? It doesn't matter whether you're age 7 or 87. The way to God, the way to a fulfilled heart, mind, and soul is through Jesus Christ to God the Father. Now, okay, so... Souls, I've mentioned Psalm 107, verse 9. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. If your soul is hungry, if you are empty, Jesus said, come unto me and drink. It's the great message of the feast. That's why this is interlinked. We come off of this great high because it reminds us this is the answer. It was the answer for us at one point. It is the answer for you today. It is the answer for the people tomorrow. This is the great mantra. Psalm 78 in the New Living Translation connects in an interesting way to us, talking about these generational dynamics. It says, we will not hide these truths, I would say the joy of the feast, from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord about his power, his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to our children. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. What an inclusive thought. We have a responsibility for our children not yet born for our children not yet married, for the world to come. We must use the joy, as Mr. Uh, Shemit brought out this, that we must invest the time to reinforce that this is the way forward. And they in turn will teach their children. Somebody in turn answered the call of God and we are here today. Somehow people continued to look to God. He is the answer. So each generation set, should set its hope anew on God. You and I have set our hope, the world's hope, is on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. It's a lovely piece of scripture, isn't it? Even the children not yet born. I just love that part. So the remedy, a part of this remedy, turn to John 3.16. Remember this famous verse? May I read it this way today? For God so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You and I are the world. God so loved the world. God loved mankind, but he loved you. He loves me. Our young people, people of all ages who, per, who partake of social media more than they partake of God's richness, need reminded, need encouraged, need filled with the opportunity. Pause and just pray to God because what he answers, that's what this psalm says. He, what? he gave miracles 
people obeyed his commands. God has richly rewarded us with a cleansed conscience, with a renewed life. The feast is this message that everybody needs. But we need to remind them that God so loves them. He loves you. He loves me. We don't have to have a fear of missing out. We don't have to fear being bullied because God is for us. God is for the world. God has a way in which says, come unto me and I will give you life. Social media doesn't necessarily do it the same way. Now, there's an interesting element of this, I thought, that the Barna Group brought out, which is fascinating to me. It says, perhaps in the church community, we have been so focused on creating disciples for Jerusalem that we have forgotten that we live in Babylon. Daniel and his cohorts, right? They did not live in Jerusalem. They had to know how to get along in Babylon. Okay, the world around us, are we equipped? Do we understand the difference between living in Jerusalem and living in Babylon? They put it this way in their work about Gen Z. They said, where are we today? If you live in Jerusalem, faith is at the center of life and society. If you live in Babylon, faith is at the margins, right? Go to school today, where's faith? We can't openly talk about it in the workplace. We can go to, you know, we can go to our workplace as well. You know, you, there are certain places you can say a little things, but everybody out here, you know, faith is allowed to exist just so you don't ram it down anybody's throat. Well, it's more than that. You can't even bring it up sometimes. If you live in Jerusalem, it's a mono-religious society. There's God. The world around us is very pluralistic. You can believe whatever you want, right? Just don't tell me how to believe, right? Jerusalem is a slower paced. We live in an accelerated, frenetic society. Life is simpler, perhaps. I love the one. Jerusalem, you know, if it was a theocracy, is a central controlled place. We live in an open source environment coming at us from many ways. But the incredible one to me is the idol at the bottom. If you live in Jerusalem, the idol you have is self-piety. We were born in Jerusalem. We are the chosen people. We are in the right place, the right time. We belong here. God is ours. If you want him, perhaps we will see if we can do something. There's a lovely joke about that, as I remember it, okay? The, um, the Pope is visiting with the Prime Minister of Israel in Rome. And the Prime Minister of Israel asks the Pope, he says, uh, he says, so I understand you have a hotline on your desk to God. It's a blue phone. He says, yes. He says, do you mind if I make a call? Pope says, no, no, it'll just be you know, $5, it's fine. Gives him $5. Prime Minister of Israel picks up the phone, talks with God. Several months go by. Prime Minister is over in Jerusalem. He's in the Prime Minister's office. And he says, oh, I see you've got a blue phone too, Mr. Prime Minister. He goes, does that reach God? He says, yes. He says, may I place a call? He says, sure. He says, Pope, the Pope says, well, what will it cost? He says, nothing, it's local. <laughs> so it, it, it illustrates, right? If you live in Jerusalem, God is you, uh, us. But the idol today, the great fear is not fitting in and the fear of missing out. It is something that has spread from our young people throughout our society. But they are vulnerable because they have not yet cemented this relationship with God in their psychic, in their hearts, their minds, and their souls. There are real basics for life. The way we counter this is we talk about that there is a God, that truth really exists, that there is, this, there is how this world is. There's Babylon and there's Jerusalem, and we can train and understand and help you navigate it. This is who we are. You know who we are? We are people of great hope. The feast, the eighth day, our festivals reinforce that God has given us a hopeful message to send to all people at all times in all generations. That is the message of the Holy Days, is that God wants all. And we see in the process, and it says in what, the 
in the process of time that God will give people that access. It's an incredible thing. And this is who and what God and Jesus Christ are about and that you are included. We can make that offer to anybody, anytime. If they're down and out, God's the answer. Do they have to come and pray with you in your pew, at your church, in your time, with your Bible open to your scriptures? No. We believe that God, just as we heard those two piece, two violins playing the same, if you would, written by the same composer, and certain times they come together and certain times they go, they seem to go apart, but then they don't. It's the same hopeful message that you guys could hold out to people and watch God lead their lives, change them. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, I think this fear of missing out and the fear of not fitting in allows us to springboard onto a scripture. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it's picking up in verse 1, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, I present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now notice what he says here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word conformed, schizimatio, okay? I put it on the screen so you could see it. It means to conform oneself to another's pattern. This is why it is so difficult when you partake of your identity for only your online friends and craft an image which, is not, which can only be seen, if you would, through photos, images, the things you like. Because you're, of con you con you're not careful, you conform to another's pattern. You fashion oneself according to that which is accepted by all. The schema part of this word says, lay stress on the outwardness of your image. Vine's commentary, uh, uh, Expository Dictionary says, the verb has more a special reference to that which is transitory, changeable, and unstable. It is not akin to what's on the inside. We always say, well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's not true. Words hurt deeply, right? And this is what we see. But Paul says, look, as you're trying to live out, don't be conformed to another's pattern. Look and be conformed, be what? Transformed by God. Transformed is the word metamorpho. Why do I put the caterpillar through the, through the butterfly here? Because a caterpillar is how you're born. And eventually you turn into the butterfly because God will give us eternal life. We will fly anew, if I can use that analogy. Look, the obligation of this word means to undergo a complete change, which under the power of God finds its full expression in your character and conduct. In other words, you must first become this solid, anchored person on the inside, and then you begin to adopt your exterior persona. That is morph. The metamorpho, the morph lays stress on the inward change that is required to be anchored, to fill the longing soul, it says in 107, verse 9. This is where the stress must lie. Vines also makes the comment, it says, the pre present continuous tense here indicates a process. The concept is transformed the ED, you know, we don't think a lot of these things mean something, but they did. It, it captures the concept that the metaphor morpho was this process of change. That's why the caterpillar to the butterfly is, is the perfect uh, analogy, if you would. But believers are transformed into what? The same image. They're change, transformed by the changing effects of having the Holy Spirit to see the things of matter, the things that see the things of worth. 
We're not immune, my friends, about how and what is going on. We must see ourselves as God sees us. God sees us as sons and daughters. How do we fit in? How do we not miss out? We get connected with God. He is the one who's about creating children to be with him forever. You know, we had a lovely um, opportunity to be in Lake George, and in Lake George, Mr. Mark Graham was there who's composed many of the hymns in our book. He played the piano. Oh, it was lovely to be with him. And, uh, and you know, we were going back and forth. And so he, one of the days I led the hymns and I made sure he was on the schedule to play with me that day. I didn't hog him for this next time, the next two times, but I let others share him. But, you know, so I made sure we did his hymns when I led hymns that day. And we were talking back and forth before the feast, which ones we would do. And he says, you know, I wrote God is Calling Children because of the mandate in the church that God, that we had seen that we were talking that God is calling children, that we're all children of God. I think sometimes we, we sing the hymn thinking, oh, God's calling little ones. No, he, he, he wrote it to remind us as big old adults, gruff and readies, that God's calling us and we're the children. You know what I mean? Anyway, artists have an interesting way of, of taking things and putting them together. He and another lady from Kentucky did two piano duets that were that would remind you of the um, special music today so it was great so let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 because who are we imitators all of interesting to me we use this verse and I wanted to zero in on it. it says therefore be imitators of God as dear children I reference the part here of children, but notice the word imitators, imitates, okay, means the followers continually. Imitators today means your imitation, you know. You have the this, this stuff that imitates good brown sugar, you know, we call it an imitation. Well, it's like it, but it's not. This is, it's an un, you know, language has changed. The better word for us, be, be, we're a follower of God. We're, being, we're fashioning our inward character by being transformed on the inside so that we, on the outside we become what? Similar to God. We're not conformed by what? The things on the outside that affect the inside. We must be changed from the inside out. That's the purpose of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It's a special thing. The imitators. Vine's expository dictionary makes a comment about this word. It says, it is used in exhortations to become. The very follower is to follow and be like the one you're following. In the continuous uh, perfect sense, it is a dis where it means, I thought this was great, a decisive act with permanent results. You see, by calling on God for help, it's a decisive act that has permanent and lasting results because you begin to follow. As we heard in the sermonette, follow and follow. It does no good to go to Christ only once. You must drink of him every day, right? You must drink in. Mr. Vieira and I, are, he, I remember talking, and he, every once in a while he'll remind me about you know, the Lord's Prayer. He says, it's a spiritual prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. What daily bread is our daily dose, our daily bread of Jesus Christ, the living word of God. We, we need it. Vines makes another comment about this word for imitation, imitators. This is, in these instances, coupled with the continuous tense referred to, it teaches that we become at conversion what we must diligently continue to be thereafter. We are converted once we're in this process of being transformed. Notice 1 John. 1 John. First John chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him, in Christ, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold, verse, chapter 3, verse 1, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. 
Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. It doesn't know us because we're what? We're transforming ourselves. We're not conforming to the way in which the world says you must be and act. But, but verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know this, that when he is revealed, that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This should give us confidence and courage and strength off of the feast as we go forward, as we think about how is it that we be, are renewed in our minds and things daily. Turn back to Ephesians second. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Notice how he puts it here to the Ephesian church. Verses 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. There's a lot in this verse. God began at the beginning a plan in which he would bring children to him. We heard this about the feast. We hear it on the Feast of Trumpets. We hear this great message. But we must have it stir up that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Why? We're holy because Jesus Christ made us holy. Brings us in before God. Having predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. God is adopting sons into him. This is where we get our worth. Notice down in verse 13 where he says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of your, our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. This is what God, God's view is that I've sealed you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you the capacity, the capacity to have power, love, and of a sound mind. The, the very, very word power in for, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the word power is dunamis. The word dunamis means the capacity, the ability, the ability to say no to sin, the ability to not be conformed, but be transformed. And when we're up against the, the sin, when we're up against the peer pressure, when we're up against, well, they want me to be this way, we can be what? No, we can go to God and we can be transformed. We can ask for God's view, God's thought, God's worth. We don't get our worth from what others think of us. You know what I mean? We, we don't have to have 5,000 friends on Facebook. Now, I mean, we, I mean, you know, we, we criticize those things because they are a dramatization of, of what can happen. We all have many good friends, and we all are, have a Facebook account, and we all try to use it responsibly and all those type of things, right? But I'm saying some people are only filled with this image that others have of them, and God's image is that you're a child of God. You are guaranteed to be with Christ through a salvation process. God wants us to be excited with that news, to offer that hope to other people who are empty and only filling them, themselves with the conforming to this world. It's, it's ideas, and we see, we see all this, and people are very vulnerable. Young people are extremely vulnerable to this very concept. God doesn't want them to be conformed. He doesn't want them to worry about fitting in because they fit in with God. All of us, you and I, everybody, we have a place with God. We don't have to fear missing out because God has given us a way forward. The Christian, New Bible Commentary makes this lovely quote. It's just one sentence. I loved it. The Christian does not run aimlessly not knowing the point of the race or where the finishing post is. The finishing post is, the, is what? The resurrection, the world tomorrow, the kingdom of God when God changes everything. The finishing post. We run this race. Paul makes a great metaphor for this over, doesn't he? Taken from uh, uh, how we run matters. I got that slide used by permission from wiki commons by the way i have the source and the attribution cited below so i can use that just want to make sure you know the live webcast wouldn't want to be in trouble with anybody um but what's it take to throw somebody in the air and have them land on the ice 
hours and hours and time, weeks, months, years. Brethren, we practice giving hope to people, hope to our children, hope to our grandchildren, hope to the people we work with. We're looking for the opportunity to, to, to weave the host, hopeful message inside their, their sometimes weak and lonely lives. How can we do it? How can we offer the word of encouragement? How can, you know, Peter says what? To give a defense for the hope that lies within you. The apologia is to do what? Is to offer the hope. They have to see the hope. They have to see that we aren't, we aren't trodden down with this view of being conformed and not fitting in. We fit in with God. Go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. By the way, the skaters are Tazarov and Morozov, the 2018 Winter Olympics. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. We see this concept that Paul was bringing out. Notice what it says in verse 24. He says, do you not know those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do not do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for the imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, test, which I have preached to others, lest when I have preached to others I have found myself to be disqualified or a castaway. There's a couple of words that I'd like to zero in on. Race. Race. I'm not going to go in depth, but race is standion means the course of life. There is the furlong, the Roman one-eighth of a mile, or there's the stadium. The word can mean both. There's the stadium, there's the full race, and then there's the specific race. You and I are in this race. The race what? Not the race to get to the resurrection first. <laughs> that would be... No, the, the, the race, we're in a course, a way of living, okay? A way of thinking, a way of of con not conforming, but transforming our lives. This is the race. Now, the other word I wanted to zero in on, prize. I won't, prize, there is a goal line, okay? There is a resurrection. But this one, notice what it says here, verse 20, uh, yeah, five. The, one of the New King James trans translations that doesn't quite fulfill up to the mark. And everyone who competes for the prize, the word, you find it in uh, the Revised Standard Version, really was translated, the strive for the mastery. That this word, okay, means the agonizing effort. Agonizing effort. This is where we get the word agonize, okay? But we always, we use, always use the word agonize in the negative sense. Agonizing, we're making the decision. No, no, no. But the, there is effort. The, the agony that comes from getting up at six in the morning so that you have time, what? To say hello to God, okay? Or whatever it is, whether you do it at night, I'm not saying that, whatever. But I'm saying we have to turn the dial. We have to make some effort. We have to strive for the mastery, not compete, as in we're competing against each other. We're striving for the mastery of the whole gospel, hopeful message, right? This is what we're after. We're contending. We're engaging. The other word was temperate. It is the practice living, I would submit to you, by the Holy Spirit. Vines even uses the comment that it's the consistency, the temperate. The consistency. There's a value in consistency. People will tell you, you know what I mean? If you make your bed every day for 30 days, let me tell you, it's pretty hard in the 31st day not to make it. Like, wait, 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 that, 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 that's out of place. You know what I mean? Habits. That's how people learn to play an instrument. You know, they don't practice once a week. They practice hours. It's consistencies. Mothers create great consistency in people and musicians, etc. Oh, I would like to comment about crown. Stephanos. It means the crown, the roundness of the crown that would go on the head, okay, if you run. But I thought it was interesting as a sidebar. Mr. Chemet mentioned getting 
you know, sidetracked. So here's my sidebar on the word crown. The word crown in the New Testament, when it refers to us, always is Stephanos. It is never diadem. You know, we have a hymn that says royal diadem, meaning the crown that belongs only to the king of kings. The Greek word here is Stephanos. And only all nine times in the New Testament refers to an athlete, the Olympic Games, those who strive for the mastery. It never refers to the king. The diadem belongs to the king of kings. It's his crown. It's his righteous rule that shall be. That is interesting. So don't equate the crown that goes on Christ with the crown, the wreath that goes on those who run. We will all be standing with laurel leaves and other things on our heads, right? Because we ran. Because we what? Have the victory through Christ Jesus who wears the crown, the diadem. Thought it was interesting. Now there's a lovely little metaphor that I won't take time to, but you know, you could build a whole message off of verse 26 where it says, thus I fight not as one who beats the air. You have the lovely metaphor that a shadow boxer who was preparing and, and, and straining and pushing at his muscles. And we also have the analogy of what the, we fight against the principalities and powers in the air. We fight against what's inside and where we get our worth. Do we want to fit in through the power of God? Have our hearts, our minds, and souls connected to the eternal power? Or do we want to fit in, conform ourselves to only that which is thought to be worth if you have the right boots, the right jeans, the right jewelry, the right approach, the right language, the right fashion? Are we patterning ourselves in fashion? And I'm not saying we don't dress well, right? Don't, we don't put on a suit. We don't put on a tie. We don't, you know, have these, that's not the one I'm talking about. Right? I'm talking about the way in which we fit into ourselves, our very person, our very DNA, is to put God's spirit in with us and then watch us change, watch us grow, watch us mature. This is what all people really need. We saw this focus. If we will focus continually in our personal lives on the fact that there is a God, that truth exists, that this, the world is living, living in Babylon, but who we are are people full of hope. And God and Jesus Christ are called all people to that hope. We will be physically safe for sure, but we will not be psychologically vulnerable. We will not have any fear of missing out because we will know from the pages of the Bible, from the depths and the touch of our knee to the floor, that our God is for us loves us, intends for us to use his spirit and to spread the hope. There's a great verse in your Bible. In Revelation chapter 7, in Revelation chapter 7, if we are to think well about living with Christ in the future, about adopting his culture and his way, if we are to be believers who put forward hope, then we must remember that our friends our family, the people we work with, the people who we maybe aren't friends with today. They may be here in this verse. Verse 9 of chapter 7 of Revelation says, After these things I looked, and behold, there were a great multitude, which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes because they ran the race. White robes are righteousness. Righteousness what? That is granted by the blood of Jesus Christ with palm branches in their hands. Multitude that could not be numbered. This is how God sees the future. Not here little, there little. 12,000, 144,000, worried about that. We must remember the gift we can give to other people, ourselves, our children, our neighbors, our families and friends, that an all-inclusive God intends for all to fit in and none will miss out. Let us go forward with this feast hopeful message and help anybody who's wanting fill their soul 
with a goodness that God can give. 